immediate, complete, and unconditional withdrawal from the territory of Ukraine. That is the call tonight from the United Nations on Russia. It's the wording of a resolution that was just passed resoundingly by the UN General Assembly with 141 countries backing it. The UN took the rare step of calling an emergency special session to vote on a 10-point plan to end the fighting just as the first anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine approaches. But unlike Security Council resolutions, this one by the General Assembly is not legally binding on any of the member states. Let's go now to our very own Enos Pohl. She has been following developments for us at the UN in New York. Enos, so we've got approval of this resolution overwhelmingly, but by how big of a margin are we talking about? Yeah, it is indeed overwhelming and it's a huge success for the Western Alliance led, I think that's fair to say, by President Joe Biden. So 141 nations voted four in favor of this resolution, 32 abstained and seven against. So this is really uh, the second highest uh, vote for uh, a resolution regarding the war in Ukraine. Brent, I think it's uh, worth to have a little bit of a deeper look. So Russia, Belarus, North Korea, Mali and Nicaragua voted against uh, the resolution. Mm -hmm. Brazil, and that is important, voted in favor. They voted the first time also in favor. The last uh, resolution, October 2022, they voted against it. And now they voted for it. And the reason for that is Joe Biden sat down with President Lula for two hours in the White House and convinced him. So there was a lot of groundwork which led to this huge success. And, you know, a lot of commentators today, Enos, have been saying um, that Vladimir Putin's plan is just to wait out the West and that it's just been a year, maybe two years have passed, and this solidarity that we're seeing with Ukraine is going to fall away. This vote today, it may not be legally binding, but, I mean, would you agree it sends the signal that, that global sentiment in support of Ukraine has not weakened? It does send a signal and it does send a strong signal, but Brent, this resolution was really watered down. It's uh -huh really in a way very common places which are made there. They didn't agree on really uh, bringing Putin in front of a trial. That was a, a request kind of or a wish from a Ukraine. They want, the re resolution says uh, this war should come to an end, but it doesn't really say how. So yes, this is a success, but uh, the danger of the alliance kind of weakening and fa falling apart is far from over because many nations, especially uh, from the global south, now say let's end this war as soon as possible, even if that would mean uh, that Ukraine would give some uh, Russian occupied territories like Crimea, for example, uh, to Putin if this would lead to an end of this war. So we shouldn't overstate uh, uh, this uh, outcome because, again, the resolution was, some say, a vanilla resolution, a definitely watered down resolution. Yeah. Some people would say whitewashing the realities of war. Our Washington Bureau Chief Enos Poe with the latest on that UN General Assembly resolution vote. Enos, as always, thank you. Well, the fighting, it has devastated Ukraine and had a major impact on the global economy and on international relations. But what about inside Ukraine? The UN has recorded more than 8,000 civilian deaths from the fighting. It says the real figure is probably much higher. Around a third of the population has been displaced. Millions have fled their home country. The UN says more than 17 million Ukrainians are in need of humanitarian assistance. Russia has suffered repeated setbacks on the battlefield, but it still controls about a fifth of Ukrainian territory. And Mariupol, it is one of the cities in Russian-controlled Ukraine. Over the last year, we spoke repeatedly to Maria Serechenko. She managed to escape from Mariupol along with other civilians while Russian troops blockaded her home city. Earlier, she told us what life was like in her hometown before the invasion. Hi, thanks for having me tonight. Yeah, it's 
very strange to you know think about what was one year ago and one year ago i was actually um, not having any fear because i couldn't imagine that the full-scale invasion would actually happen so you know the mariupol was um, a rapidly booming city full of um, happy people. My parents were living there also, my whole family, and it was really growing, developing. No one could imagine that something terrible would really happen, even though since 2014, when the war in Donbass started, Mariupol was really close to the front line. But nevertheless, you know, it was relatively calm and safe before the full invasion started. Um, you yourself, you've experienced a, a tragedy, the likes of which um, Europe has not seen in decades. Um, you know, most of the city that you're from has been destroyed. I mean, the pictures, you know, they tell the story. Uh, how has that affected you personally? I mean, how have you, how have you tried to cope seeing your home city devastated? It's really hard to, you know, to digest, to process that I have no home anymore, that my parents lost their home, my grandparents and all my family is now scattered all around the world. They are in different countries. We cannot gather for a family dinner for Christmas. And it's really hard to understand that, you know, we won't be able to come back probably in the near future because actually like most of the city it was destroyed and um, it's, do you hope, uh, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. do, do you hope that you'll be able to go home one day? I mean, is that something that you allow yourself to think about? I have hope, I have faith that we'll be able to go back, uh, to go home, and the city will be deoccupied really soon. But unfortunately, you know, we can't predict when exactly will we happen. But anyway, as you've seen the pictures, there is no Mariupol anymore, like the city that was before the full invasion, before the war. So even if we go back, it won't be the same. Maria, do you, do you have contact, still have contact with people who are still in Mariupol or around Mariupol? I have some of the people who were uh, like my relatives, for example, they were in uh, Azovstal and they were captive. They were held in prison uh, by Russians. Now they are on Ukrainian territory. And fortunately, my whole family, like, you know, my family is uh, out of Mariupol, they escaped. But I have some of the people who are still there. I know them and, you know, I still see some photos of them, even mm -hmm. on social medias, but I can't talk to them anymore, you know, frequently. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's mm -hmm. the reality. We have reported uh, all through the year about just the, the sheer numbers of Ukrainians who fled the country when this war began. You and I have talked about that before as well. You did not flee. I mean, you're still in Ukraine. Kind of explain to our viewers what went into your decision to, to stay inside the country that is being attacked. I think it's a choice. It's a choice of morality and it's uh, my personal feeling that I'm needed here. I have lots of my friends, my colleagues who decided to just go to the army without any previous military experience. They just left their jobs and they are defending the country. And when I look at them, I realize that um, I, you know, I can do something here. I can volunteer, I can help, I can, you know, gather some money, I can work and be useful for the economy. So it's kind of a morale choice to, to be here, mm -hmm. to stay in, in Ukraine. Tomorrow is the one year mark for this war. Um, what do you think we'll be talking about one year from today? I really hope and I believe, I believe with all my heart that we'll be talking about our victory, we'll be talking about rebuilding Ukraine, rebuilding Mariupol, about investing, you know, 
money, about people coming back, about Ukraine becoming a center of, you know, tourism and uh, many other things uh, which yeah. are associated with peaceful life. So yeah. I really believe that there won't be any war in our country in one year. It's, well, it's my personal belief. Well, I, I, I am sure that there are lots of people around the world who share that, that hope with you, Maria. And um, we certainly wish you and your family all the best moving forward. Maria Serdachenko joining us tonight from Kyiv in Ukraine. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Well, it is yet another clear sign of international indignation over Russia's attack on Ukraine. Delegates meeting in Vienna at the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, boycotted the session because the Russian representative was present. The OSCE includes 57 countries. It was created during the Cold War to promote East-West dialogue. Ukraine has called for Russia to be expelled, but the rules make that unlikely. Natalia Pipa is a Ukrainian member of parliament. She came to the Hofburg in Vienna to take part in the OSCE's parliamentary assembly. But now that she's here, she won't be going inside. Why? Because the Russian delegation has arrived. Murders are in prison. It is reason why we are boycotting the session of OSCE, because murders is on the table of negotiation. Delegations representing Ukraine and Lithuania are boycotting the event, and a Slovakian member of parliament left the assembly on behalf of Ukraine. We must not let these warmongers win. Not now, not ever. Slava Ukraine! The president of the parliamentary assembly believes that Russians should be present, but thinks that now is not the right time for dialogue with Russia. One year into this awful war, it is indeed the momentum to further increase pressure on Russia and to do all we can to ensure they are hearing the words unified support for Ukraine. Mikita Potorayev, head of the Ukrainian delegation, demands reforms within the OSCE. If one country member of OSCE starts war of aggression against another country member, uh, the uh, presence of uh, its delegation in OSCP should be suspended. On top of all this, every OSCE member country has veto powers. Because of Moscow's veto, the organization has had to stop projects in Ukraine. Our correspondent, Rosie Bertrand, she's in Vienna, and she told us how Austria is responding to the criticism over its decision to invite the Russian delegation. Now, Austria has come under some political criticism for issuing visas to these Russian parliamentarians, members of this parliamentary assembly. But I spoke to a spokesperson for the Austrian Foreign Ministry and she insisted that her country is under international law obligations to issue these visas to members of the parliament, parliamentary assembly because Austria is the official host country of the OSCE. This has shed a spotlight on Austria, which is a militarily neutral. But that spokesperson wanted to point out, of course, that Austria has been supporting Ukraine through humanitarian aid, through sanctions on Russia and the fact she said that around 50,000 Ukrainians now call Austria home as refugees. There was quite a scene to behold here in Vienna as one Russian lawmaker began talking at this parliamentary assembly. The room began emptying out because there was a walkout. Now that lawmaker went on to say he was happy people were leaving because it cleared up the atmosphere and he was very critical of the way this whole parliamentary assembly is being conducted. Now, this, these talks are expected to continue on Friday and so too is the controversy because of course that coincides with that fateful day one year ago, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine.